Welcome to the Garments Engage Crochet Podcast, where I chat about crochet garments and other yarny things. I am Michelle Ferguson, crochet pattern designer of Two Brothers Blankets. You can find me at twobrothersblankets.com, on Facebook and Instagram at Two Brothers Blankets, and right here on YouTube every week for this crochet podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad you're here. I hope you'll hit that subscribe button and click the like button if you like what you see. And if you want to be notified every time I upload a new video, click the bell at the top of your screen. So today I have an exciting designer interview for you. Um, I interviewed Sarah of SEK Handmade. Sarah is so positive and uplifting and funny and she's just like one of those people that are like instantly easy to talk to. So I really enjoyed chatting with her and talking to her about some of her designs and how she got started and um, yeah, all the fun crochet designing chit chat. So let's get right into it and check it out now. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. I am here with Sarah of SEK Handmade. Sarah is one of my good designer friends and I'm so glad to have you here, Sarah, to chat with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here with you. Yay, okay, so tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, your family, how you got into this, that kind of thing. Okay, um, I am currently in Wisconsin and um, I, we, we moved here almost immediately before the pandemic started. <laughs> so that's a little crazy because we've been here for about a year and a half, but we're still not really settled because we, you know, it's really hard to meet people when <laughs> you're in a <laughs> pandemic. So um, I grew up, I was born and grew up in Iowa. I'd been a Midwest girl my whole life. And I met my husband in college and he said, we're going to Tucson for graduate school. And I cried. Oh no. <laughs> that reminds I, me of when we moved to Florida. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, we had never, I'd never, well, we had been, he'd been looking at graduate schools all over the place. And so we had the last one he thought was a, a thing was um, Eugene, Oregon, which is like lush and green and beautiful. And I like never traveled to that part of the country. And then he was like the desert. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So we moved, we lived there for eight years. And that was an interesting experience because neither of us had been away from our families. Um, so we really learned to depend on each other, but we knew we wanted to get back to the Midwest to be close to family. So we got as close as we could and lived in Ohio for about eight years. And then um, my husband is from Wisconsin. So when he got the opportunity to uh, move to a new job in Wisconsin, we jumped on it. And really we're so lucky that he did because throughout the whole pandemic, we never would have seen family being, it was a 12 hour drive to my parents' house. And like, that's just not pandemic friendly. <laughs> <laughs> so we're really lucky um, to be close because we get to see family a lot more often, even though we haven't really uh, settled into the community yet. When we lived in Tucson, I was a teacher I taught elementary school music and I worked um, at a school that did a modified year round schedule. And so we would have um, breaks every couple months and then a slightly larger break in the summer. And since um, Brian was in graduate school and I, it was summer in the desert. <laughs> and really hot, I would go back and visit my parents for like two weeks at a time. And so one um, summer when I went back, my mom said, we're going to learn how to knit. And I said, I don't want to learn how to knit. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, it's going to be so much fun. I learned when I was younger. And so my mom taught me to knit, which was, um, I, I don't know, I, I don't recommend it because it, she had not knit for probably 20 years and she's going okay so you do this oh no wait no maybe oh. that's not how it goes <laughs> <laughs> oh boy <laughs> and this was before YouTube so it was like we're looking at a book and like is that what that means yeah so 
that was um, that was tough. And I remember learning to knit being really hard. I remember sitting on their couch and practicing and going, I just can't do this. I had like frogged my like teeny scarf like 80 times. Mm-hmm. And my dad was like, well, Sarah, this might just take some practice. Oh. And I was like, okay, dad, you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I practiced. I stuck with it. It was probably good that I was home for such a long stretch of time because um, by the time I left, I was fairly comfortable with it. And I was totally content knitting for several years. But then I found Ravelry. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I first got into Ravelry, I didn't know you could filter designs by knit and crochet. And so like I just searched like hat pattern. Mm. And these things would come up and I'd be like, oh, that's so cute. And I'd click on it. It would be crochet. And I didn't know how to crochet. (laughs) (laughs) So um, when my oldest was about 18 months and we were living in Ohio and we knew almost no one. And it was just me at home with this tiny little person that could like barely do anything. (laughs) (laughs) I said to my husband, I want to take a crochet class. I need to do something for myself. I need to get out of the house. I need to talk to adult people. (laughs) And so I took a crochet class at a local yarn store and it was fun. I, knowing about uh, tensioning in yarn and like that, since with my um, knitting experience, I already had some idea of like, the bigger the hook or the bigger the needle, the fatter the yarn needs to be and that kind of stuff. So I felt like that really helped me get crochet more quickly. However, when you knit, you have your stitches and you do your stitches. Mm -hmm. When you crochet, you can go anywhere. Right. (laughs) You know, you can go in a circle, you can like turn and go this way and make something off to the side and that blew my mind a little bit because I'm a very visual person. And so Mm -hmm. if I couldn't see, if I couldn't picture in my mind what that was going to do, it was really hard for me. But thankfully, YouTube came along and then I could look up videos. (laughs) So I I really enjoy um, doing both. They both have different, um, different looks. Um, But one of my favorite things to do is to try to figure out stitches and stuff that look the same in knitting and crochet and to try to like mimic them yeah anyways so um I decided I was I I was knitting and crocheting and making all the things for my own sanity and then I kind of looked around and thought how many hats can one person have (laughs) (laughs) and the answer is not a lot even when you live in the midwest where it snows and stuff so I decided I was going to do a craft fair and I got in my head this crazy idea that like I couldn't sell things unless they were fully mine so I started (laughs) which is not true right (laughs) it's not true lots of designers give permission to sell their patterns including me Mm -hmm. but because I felt like I had to, I started um, designing just some simple patterns to sell items at um, craft fairs. And I did a few craft fairs and then we moved. Uh And it was like, you know, like, how do you do that? And so after designing for craft fairs, I decided, well, maybe I could Oh, I know. I did a, I was always so intimidated to like publish my designs because I'd seen all these fancy templates and like you buy somebody's design and it looks like it's been professionally published. And I thought like, I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I did a test knit for a really big designer and I opened her pattern and it was just, it was beautiful, but it was clean and it was simple. And I thought, well, I could do that. Yeah. And like, she's a professional and like she sells, it seems to me, you know, thousands of patterns every time she releases. And if she can do that, well, I, I mean, not that I can sell thousands of patterns, but I could make my pattern look like that. Right. And so um, I started designing and eventually I decided that I really love designing. Um, like I said, I was a teacher mm-hmm. and I always wanted to teach. And I love yarn craft and I 
my biggest fear was that I'd like only have one idea of what to design, but that's not been the case. I have lots of ideas. And so doing designs has been the perfect blend of creativity and teaching for me. And so I really, I really enjoy it so much. So you've only been designing what, two years now? Well, I said that, but now that I think back to it, I think oh, was it before designing. you moved? It was before we moved. Okay. Um, I've been designing for five years now, I think. Oh, cool. Okay. I was about to say, I was like, I know I followed you like before you moved and during your move on Instagram. So I was like, surely she was designing yeah. by then. <laughs> cool. Okay. So how many patterns do you have right now? Like published? I'm so excited because I just got 50 patterns. Woohoo! I remember my 50th pattern. Like I remember the exact pattern and I was like 50 patterns <laughs> congratulations that's awesome thank you what is your favorite oh what is my favorite I think I have favorites depending on season I also feel like a little bit like my last thing I made is always my favorite <laughs> me too I do that too like, it takes a lot of um a lot of focus and a lot of, depending on the design, a lot of work to get it just right. And so I feel like once I've poured that time into it, it's like, ha, ah, it's like my little baby. Yes. Yes. I just finished a commission design and I'm like, and I can't keep it. <laughs> like I'm upset because oh. I worked so <laughs> so like, I'm like, and then I, but then I like have like, no, I don't want to make myself a whole nother one. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, I gotta send it off because it's like your baby, like you said. It's like ah, so I totally get it. Um. Okay. Yeah. So, what would you say is the best part and hardest part of being an independent designer? You're not just crochet. You have knit too, don't you? I, I do have a crochet designer, now. but crochet and knit designer. Yes, I do have a few knitting patterns. Um, I think the best, <laughs> I kind of think the best and worst part is probably the same thing. Um, <laughs> it's that I have uh, the freedom to do what I want. So if uh, things come up, uh, you know, kids get sick or like um, I, we decided to uh, keep our boys at home for school last year. We took them out of public school and put them in a virtual academy. And because of my, you know, working for myself, yep. I had the flexibility to say, I'm going to take a step back. I mean, I had no idea if I was going to get any designs published this last school year when we decided that we were going to pull the boys out. Like I had a little mourning period because my youngest was going to kindergarten. So that was supposed to be my year where yeah. everybody was off at school all day. And I had all day to really focus on my business. And I had all these plans for what I was going to do now that I had, you know, really dedicated time. And that all went out the window. But a lot of people had to make some really tough decisions and did or did not have the flexibility to even make those kinds of decisions. Um, but on the flip side of that, <laughs> nothing gets done I make myself do it or I'm I'm a pretty um, driven person. I'm not a person who like, um, who just like lounges around a bunch. I started, yeah. I started painting my fingernails recently to force myself to sit still <laughs> because once your fingernails are painted, you just kind of have to sit there. And so yeah. I've been cool. trying to, to sit still a little more, but my issue with that is that I think Oh, I'll do that. Oh, I'll do that. Oh, I'll do that too. Yeah. <laughs> and then it comes to like October or whatever. And it's like, uh, oh, yeah, I'm doing all of that. <laughs> I can totally, totally relate. Yes. And even as, so I worked, I had two, two years, three years, three years of um, nobody home. My youngest went off to school. 
three years of nobody home working and then I we pulled him out to homeschool and we're on year three of homeschooling so and like honestly I thought like I had a morning period too where I thought I was done for good Mm -hmm. and it actually worked out even better because now we have more freedom and flexibility to work when we need to school when we need to this and that so it worked out Mm -hmm. perfectly like I would not change it for the world but I totally remember that period of being like this is it this is over like (laughs) yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to be able to do both and thankfully I am able to do both but mm-hmm. I do remember that feeling of just like so yeah yeah and totally I don't know good. how many I don't know how many designs I did publish last year but I did continue to publish and we mm-hmm. did find that it worked once we got in the rhythm of school and figured out like what does this look like and what's really required mm-hmm. of us I was able to um to continue designing okay. and I will be very interested to see how um, my kids do go going yeah. back to a full day of you got to be at school all day long. I always felt days, so rushed yes, while they were at were, school. There were days when, um, like last fall, I remember one day it was super stressful at the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, and I sure. remember one day we had it had been really chilly and we had a day where it was just really nice and I said we're going to the park and yep. they were like that's so what? nice yes and yes. I was like school doesn't technically school doesn't even have to be done today but it certainly doesn't have to start at eight o'clock in the morning yeah. so we're going to the park and we're gonna get out and play and relax and we'll do school when we get around to school it'll be fine so it'll be interesting to see that. I mean, that's not how they, happening. yeah, because they're going back. All right, let's see. Um, what advice would you give yourself as a beginner crocheter? Like if you were talking to your brand new beginner crocheter self, mm-hmm. what, uh, something you know now, like what advice would you give them that you know now? Give yourself, not them. Um, I would probably give my beginner self the same advice I give myself still. <laughs> and that is just do what the pattern says. <laughs> um, I am a very visual person, like I said. Mm-hmm. And if I can't picture like what that stitch is going to look like, sometimes I'm like, ah, I just don't understand. But uh-huh. if it's a well-written pattern, just do what the pattern says. Right. Just do this. And then you'll see what it's going to look like. Yeah. And so I hear you. <laughs> A lot of times, you know, I, I even get questions on my pattern or I have friends who said, my somebody came to me with this question and I don't, uh, they think the pattern is wrong, but it's not wrong, which I do a lot. I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't, I can't picture what it's going to be. It must be wrong. It can't be right. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I just say, just, just do what the pattern says. Yeah. And try exactly. it a few times. Like mm-hmm. it, it happens. It takes some Sex. practice. Yeah. And we're so used to like skimming now everything. Like mm-hmm. we all do it. We all skim. We just scroll through or whatever. Yep. And instead of like with a crochet pattern, sometimes you really have to take each step, you know, really read through each step and then work through each step, you know. Mm-hmm. So good. And point. read the pattern notes. Yes. Everybody <laughs> read their pattern notes. Because there are lots of times that I'll have people come to me or testers come to me and say, well, does the chain one at the beginning count as a stitch or something like that? And, and it's I'm in like, the pattern notes. It's in the notes, right? Oh, yes. Every yeah. time. Every so, time. I've gotten to where my pattern notes are like the page long because I just add yeah. as much as I can. <laughs> so, But and, people don't read them. They're still, I still get questions. So sometimes people yeah. are just skim through it, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, patterns are not one thing, something you want to just skim through. You definitely yeah. want to read through and then work through it. So sometimes I'll read through, like you said, I'll read through it and be like, that won't work. That, oh. no. But then when you do it, when you crochet it, 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 it does. Like there's, there's a designer, they have that creative, like they know what they're, most of the time, I'm not going to say all, <laughs> most of the time they know what they're doing and they will, you can, if you follow step by step for the stitch or whatever. So, all right. And just certainly, I have, certainly I have made mistakes in my patterns and like, yes. it's not right, but generally speaking, if it's a completed pattern, yeah. uh, you just trust it and try it a few times. And try then it. if it doesn't then work, contact. You know, yeah. Then yeah. get in touch with the designer. Um, yeah. Right. 
Okay, so for fun, what is your favorite Starbucks order or coffee shop order? Or see, I don't know if everybody drinks coffee, so I was just like favorite order. <laughs> um, I love coffee. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think it goes back to my childhood waking up in the morning to the smell of coffee brewing mm -hmm. because my dad was a coffee lover. My dad too. And so even even just the scent of brewing coffee is comforting to me. Yeah, I hear you. So I do love coffee. Um, you know, I'm sure I started drinking it because I, I felt like I needed to be an adult and drink. that's what grown up did, mm -hmm. but I do really love coffee and um, I'm not a big Starbucks person. Um, I do in the summer love a good caramel frappuccino. But I just recently found a local, uh, it's like a brunch place, but they also have a coffee bar and um, they are like, I don't go there very often because it's a little more pricey than someplace like a Starbucks, mm -hmm. but they, uh, they're an amazing cafe. They like locally source everything. It's all organic. Oh, cool. And the chef makes the syrups that go in like the lattes and stuff. Oh. And they have a vanilla lavender latte that is amazing. Oh, wow. Amazing. Wow. Interesting. I don't think I've ever yeah. had a lavender latte. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. So where can everybody follow you and purchase your patterns and find you all that? Um, I sell my patterns on Ravelry and Etsy, and I, I'm SEK Handmade on both of those. If you search those, the trick, the trick to searching for a shop on Etsy, though, and this confused me for a long time, is you start typing like SEK Handmade, and if you just hit that, if you just hit enter, a lot of times they'll search for products with that oh, name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you're typing, it'll say in the bottom of like the list of suggestions, they pop up, search for this in shop names. And if oh, you click yeah. on that, that'll get you to your shop. So I think you can, I think my, my name and my, and SEK Handmade are linked to me on Ravelry. So Sarah Korth or SEK Handmade. Um, I have sekhandmade.com is my website. I've got all sorts of tips and tutorials and stuff on there. And I am sek handmade on Facebook and Instagram, Pinterest, all the places. So cool. Where are you yeah. at most often? What I, social? Okay. On social, I am most often on Instagram. I love the visual nature and I have a, uh, <laughs> a bit of a goofy side to me. So I, I enjoy um, the chatting with people and, and making some kind of silly content and stuff. So that's probably where I hang out most. Yeah. On yeah. That's, I think that's where I first found you on Instagram. I like Instagram too. All right. I think that is all she, you guys check Sarah's patterns out on Etsy and Ravelry and her Instagram she has some beautiful patterns that she does a great job like like she said teaching and showing you um, how to work through those patterns and all that and be sure to give her a follow we'll see you guys next week Bye. all right thank you Sarah thank you okay I told you Sarah is so fun and so sweet and just really easy and like great to talk to. Um, so I hope you'll go check her out, check out her website and follow her on social media. Um, she has some really, really beautiful designs. She is a very talented designer. Um, okay, let's get into what's in my wet bag. So y'all know I film ahead for this and I'm still waiting on my yarn for the Aspen cardigan. By the next episode, I should have it and should have made progress on it and y'all can see it. So I have decided to start a camellia sweater, which is a really simple um, high-low, oversized, poncho-esque sweater. It has like a cowl neckline too, but it's really big um, with tighter sleeves. Um, really nice. And I wanted to get some new pictures of it and update it and 
add sizes. I believe it needs some sizes added to it. Um, and yeah, give it a good update. So I have started it. I'm very, very just started it. Um, but it has an amazing texture. The stitch combo has a really, really nice texture. Um, so I'm excited about that. I also ordered some Lion Brand Jeans yarn that I talked about in, I think, episode one. Um, I ordered the colorway Stonewash, I think it's called, to make my 12-year-old a little dude cardigan. So long story short, I'll try to make it short. Um, my little dude cardigan is two to 10 size, kid size is two to 10. The dude cardigan is men's extra small to two or three X, I believe. Um, there's a pretty big gap between size 10, kid size 10 and a men's size extra small. For women, or in girls, it's less of a gap. So a girl size, I think it's a 12 though, is 28 to 30 inches. An extra small is 28 to 30 inches. So that's why I usually stop at 10 for girls. And I guess I did not realize that for boys there was a whole big old gap, like 10 inches, where 12, 14, and 16 size, the sizes 12, 14, and 16 need to be. So I'm gonna add, also add those sizes to um, that pattern. And my oldest son is right in the size 14. I may make him a 16 though, so he can grow into it. Not that he'll wear it much, but down here in Florida. But uh, still, I don't want it to be too tight on him. He, it seems like he grows more every day. Every time he wakes up in the morning, he's a little bit bigger. He's huge, y'all. He's so tall. Um, but he's the perfect, he measured exactly what Craft Yarn Council says is a size 14. So I may size him up, but either way, he is gonna be my model for these bigger sizes. Um, so I'm waiting on the yarn for that too. So I'll be making a bunch of remakes. Like I said, September is gonna be all um, selfish September. <laughs> making my own stuff, not designing, giving myself a little break and getting back into it probably in October. So that is what I have in my whip bag and planned for my whip bag. And yeah, so once I get all that yarn in, I'll be sure to show you and show you my progress. Now, one of these, I'm gonna have to work hard on this before my yarn comes, cause I know I'm gonna wanna start working on the cardigans um, once I get the yarn. So we'll see how much progress I make on that. Anyways, <laughs> all right, now I want to do a product review. I'm tired, I'm not saying brutally honest you know, no more. I'm not ever brutally honest anymore. So I'm gonna do a product review for you guys today. I'm going to review, this was requested of me um, last season when I asked for your suggestions, the Furls Crochet Lucid Fork. Um, this is a, it says the ultimate cord making tool, braid eye cord without fiddly double pointed needles or a chunky knitting spool. Cord produced on a lucid fork is square, strong and springy and the fork is wonderfully easy to use. Our ergonomic handle fits comfortably in the hand and will give you braided corded, a braided, braiding cord for miles. Have you, will have you braiding cord for miles. So, this is the box that it comes in. I was actually sent this uh, to review a couple years ago, I think when they first came out with it. So you get this, here's the fork. Um, it's a just, it's a pretty wood, I think it's teak uh, color, wood. And then you get the directions in the, inside the box too. So it's really easy to use, it's great for um, making those eye cords if you want to add them to a garment, like an, on the neckline of a hoodie, or a bag, or you need a drawstring of some sort, or whatever. Um, it, it makes eye cords really easily. So I made one, I'm way out of practice. Um, I had to like try it and see if I could do it. This is probably not the best yarn. I bet like a good cotton yarn would be real, would look really good. Um, but it makes this like 3D cord for you to use however you please with your yarn. Um, it's pretty simple. Like I said, it has the 
yarn um, instructions and it has a little picture to show you how to do it and it even has a picture on the back to show you how to fasten off um, but I saw just do I don't have my stuff um, my overhead camera figured out today set up today but I'll try to show you here so it says to thread the yarn through the eyelet so the yarn end is towards you so you will if I were facing me I would thread it in so it's like this facing me um, and then you take your yarn your working yarn you kind of hold this down and you make a figure eight around the pieces like this. I hope I'm just getting started is the craziest part here. Let me turn it so you can see really good. So you got like a figure eight thing going on. You do it twice. So then you take, so you got it like this. You're going to take your bottom, the bottom yarn and pull it up over the top and over the handle, the stick. The prong, that's what they call it. So then you do it to the other side. And then you pull your middle tight. And then so it looks like this. And then you make another figure eight like this. It's a little wonky at first. Well, my yarn. Ta-da! Figure eight. You do the same thing. Take the bottom, pull it over. Kind of like knitting. Like when you knit, you're taking the loops off and then pull tight. And then you just keep on doing that. Like it's a really easy process. If you can crochet your knit, you can do this. Um, just make an eight, pull up, pull up, and it makes a cute little cord. Like I said, this yarn is probably not the best. And it, it's a lot like, and then the, yarn, the cord starts to come out through the hole. It probably, uh, like, tension is probably a big thing with it. Because I feel like my holes are really big. Or my loops. Um, and it probably takes, like, a bit of practice. Like I said, I'm not, I have not practiced. <laughs> except for right before I made this video. Um, but yeah, and then you get your little cord coming out. It's super easy. It's. Uh, really great if you like uh, do markets and make bags or whatever if you make eye cords a lot or you need to make eye cords a lot I would this is like highly recommended I would recommend it it's super nice too it's cute it's pretty it would look good in pictures or on display in your office or your yarn shelf um, and very useful and easy and then so when you fasten it off Where'd my scissors go? You cut it, you cut your yarn. What do I got stuck to me? You cut your yarn and then you, let's see if I can remember, you take the loops off and then you take, now I gotta remember, your yarn and loop it through the first loop and down up the first loop and down the next loop i believe and it closes it off yeah there we go and ta-da but like i said the direct like i know y'all couldn't see very well <laughs> much of that um and maybe i'll do an overhead after i've had some practice <laughs> um but like i said the, there's really easy to follow picture and and written instructions in the box um and it's just, it's really nice and really useful. I don't use it very often because I just don't need to. Um, but if you're someone who uses, like I said, makes a lot of eye cords or makes like you want drawstrings or for our bags or whatever, I think you'll find this very useful. So for what it's used for, I give it a 10 out of 10. It's a great, nice, sturdy, wooden uh, lucid fork. And it's from Furl's Crochet. Um, I will add my link to the description for you to check out. But I really like it, even though I don't use it very much. It's cool. So, and if I needed, if I need to make an eye cord, that's, it'll definitely be my go-to product to do that instead of trying to figure it out any other way. So, 
That is all I have for today. I hope you guys have a great week and you'll come back next Thursday and check out our next episode. Bye guys.